take some time for prayer, shall we? Father, even as we uh, come this morning, we open your word together too, and I just pray that as I um, do so this morning, give me the words to speak. Um, and as much as I share this to people here, use it in my life to challenge me and encourage me to take a stand for you. I ask in your, the Lord Jesus' name, amen. If you would, take your Bibles, open up to Hebrews 13. And I'm going to start you off with just one verse this morning. Um, Hebrews 13, 13. This, you know how we have the verse of the week? This would be my verse of the week from not this Sunday, but the Sunday before. Oh, I was doing some study that prior week there, and I ran across this verse, and I thought, wow, that's, that's, I need that verse for myself. And I thought, I would like to do a study on that, or just share that one sometime, not really knowing what I would share about it, but just the challenge of it to me. And so this morning, again, I speak this mostly to me, and if it works for you, um, God bless it, right? Okay, so Hebrews 13, 13. And it's, let us, go, let us then go to Jesus outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. Let us go to Jesus outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. What was school like for you guys? I don't know what it's like for a kid nowadays, but when I was, I think even when we were young kids, if you did something kind of a little weird or off or you dressed funny, that would stick with you. I mean, um, I'll just tell you a couple of few just examples. We had a kid named Larry that came to our school in about fourth grade. And we had in the bar, by the guy's bathroom there, they had a, instead of individual sinks, just one big half moon sink like this, probably about six foot across or so. And there was a bar, you'd step on that. And then there was a soap dispenser. So all of us guys would be lined up around there after we got done using the bathroom, washing our hands and talking and goofing off. And here was Larry, and he got a kick out of, like, taking the soap dispenser, and he would pile up soap on his hands and make a huge, and then make it into this la lather, just huge pile of lather. And everybody kind of noticed this, and so we named him Larry Lava. And that name stuck with Larry Lava for quite a while. We had another kid when I was in, he came in sixth grade. He was a fast runner. His name was Stanley. And um, if you were running alongside Larry, uh, excuse me, um, Stanley, he ran with his mouth, his teeth kind of clenched like this, and he'd go, <laughs> and he was really fast. Most people read with their mouths open. And so he picked up the name of Stanley Steamer, and that stuck with him. You know, and you, you got just this, you know, and I remember another thing, you know, like just different weird things. A kid came when I was again in fourth grade, and um, this kid who had you know, been there for years, but he'd got a haircut. It was a bad haircut. And he walked into class, and kids were kind of noticing, and he put his head down on his desk, and he's kind of half crying. And one of the kids came up and said, look at so-and-so. It looks like his mom stuck a bowl on his head and gave him a haircut. Now, I don't know why you would do that to your kid, but you learned early on when you went to school that you did not step out of the norm. You do not do anything weird because you might get a name that stuck with you for life, or at least the life in school. So when I was in seventh grade, I had become a Christian the spring before. And I went to the Bible Fellowship, which church was now is the E.B. Free Church. I went, they had added, they're going to have a Bible, the Wednesday classes, Bible classes. And so our first day there, I think Dan was there with us, uh, with me, and a couple other guys from that church. And they had a young pastor, and he said, what I'd like you guys to do now, he was going to do a study, I don't know if it was Timothy or one of the epistles, he said, now next week I want you to bring your Bibles to the Bible class at the, at the Wednesday service there. And I'm thinking, oh no, we've never had to do that for release time before. From the time, I went, from the time I was in grade school, we never brought Bibles to school. And so I went through the week kind of dreading that next Wednesday because you know how that's going to go, right? You know, kids start noticing you're bringing a Bible to school. That's a good way to get a nickname that you're not going to like. And so the week went through and it got to Wednesday the next week and as I'm getting ready for school, I thought, man, how am I going to do this? I came up with an idea. I thought, you know, I'm going to take my Bible and I'm going to stick it in a brown paper bag, and then no one will see it, and I'll bring my Bible to school. And so that's how I did I had a couple other books, and I had this Bible stuffed in a brown paper bag, and I went to the front door. My mom would always stand by the door. I'm from a family of seven. Six of us were going to school at that time. She'd give each one a hug and make sure they had their homework, and she noticed this, this brown bag. She said, Steve, what do you have in the brown bag? I said, that's my Bible. And she said, are you ashamed of Jesus? I think that was the question you asked me, Mom. And I don't remember how I answered that. 
But I, there was a lot of, at first there was conviction to me as I put it in the Bible, and then there's got my mom on top of it. I get double conviction, the Holy Spirit and also my mother, right? And so, I, you know, and I, I, ser- I was serious about the Lord Jesus at that time. And when I'd, when I'd come to know the Lord, I had made a promise to God that I would be, the, knowing that I didn't deserve salvation, that I was going to be the best witness I could be. So as I'm walking out to the bus, which is maybe here a little beyond the parsonage, um, I'm thinking about that, and I grabbed the paper bag off. I thought, you know what it says in Scripture, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. That's what Jesus says. So I took the brown paper bag off. I thought, I don't want Jesus ashamed. And my mom's also convicting me, right? So I took the brown paper bag off my Bible, and I crumpled that up. And when I got by the bushes by the driveway, I threw that bag in the bushes. But you know what? To be really honest with you, as I walked on the halls that day with my Bible, I didn't hold it up loud and proud. I held it pretty tight to my side because I didn't want people thinking I was weird for having a Bible. And I, and I share this. This verse we come out of Hebrews 13 tells us to go to Jesus outside the camp and bear the reproach he had. And even as an adult today, I still struggle with that a lot of times where, you know, someone says something or misuses the Lord's name and we don't always want to stand up and speak and claim the Lord Jesus. We're sometimes silent. I went to, I mentioned this as another little quick story from my life, a fish concert up at Bayfield here this last winter. And I, I got to the, it was a the table, the, the conference was set up in like there were groups of tables. And there's probably about eight, ten chairs around a table. And there were some other guys, and I had beat the rest of them there. So I went to bow my head, and usually my wife's with me. But again, I felt the awkwardness of it. I thought, you know, here I am. Usually there's someone beside me praying with me. You know, this time I'm alone. You know, I think of how many people pray alone, and they take a stand for the Lord Jesus. The interesting thing, and I just got to throw this little blip on the side there. As I, I pray and I'm done, I would stand up and start to, or lift my head up and start to eat. And then another fellow, because a native fellow comes across, and he's about three chairs over. And um, I, I kind of wash him out of the corner. And we had not had a formal introduction on our table yet. We part way into the conference. I'd come in late. And, and so this guy's over there, and I watch him, and he kind of looks around. All of a sudden, he puts his hands up like this and puts them down kind of quickly, you know. And I realized he just gave thanks, too. And I made a purpose in my mind. I thought, you know what? I, want, I didn't want to address that in front of everybody, you know, because then by some other guys had come around. But I'm going to sit next to him and ask him, you know, I noticed you gave thanks. And thank him for doing that because I don't know if he gave thanks to a great spirit or a, a Christian God like we know. Or maybe this great spirit is God to him. I don't know. But I did want to ask him about that. And I know, you know, he was gone the next day at lunch, so I didn't get a chance to. But it was an encouragement to me because there was another person on my table that also realized that we need to give thanks to God. And this isn't just, again, about just giving thanks, but it's about the things that identify you as a Christian. Okay, so I'm going to bring you back to this passage in Hebrews. Hebrews is, the book of Hebrews is written to people who were Jewish. And Jesus was a great divider of the Jews because... um, he changed the rules of the game. We're going to get there in just a minute. Let's not, I don't want to get ahead of the game. Let's start reading about uh, 13 and in verse 7. Is, I'm going to just bring you into the context of what's written there. It says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their life and imitate their faith. And to finish that out, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So for these Hebrew Christians, they were inclined to like move away and probably push Jesus to the side or go back to their old Jewish ways and not, you know, stick with Jesus. And that's written to them. And so the writer is telling me, says, remember, who was it that led you to the Lord? Who was it that shared the gospel with you? And for you, I don't know how you came to know the Lord if you're a Christian here today. Maybe you heard it from the radio or something like that, or read something, that's how I became Christian. But for a lot of us, there's a person in our life that shared the gospel. For me, one was my mother, who was a pillar. Um, there was another guy that was very instrumental in my life, and his name was Chuck Bloomquist. Chuck Bloomquist came to Clover Church when it was up on the Fleming Road, a couple miles up, and he was 27 years old, just a young man, took on the church, and he would minister to us kids, and he would sometimes, uh, sometimes he would teach us good, and sometimes he'd have to rebuke us. I was like in first or second grade at the time. And I remember some of the lessons that Chuck taught us. And it was after he was there a couple of years that he then went up to the Northwest ter- Territory up in the Arctic Circle and worked with the native peoples up there. And for years we would send money to him, and he said, after a while he told us, he said, you know what, I'm becoming, a, this is my home now. 
This is where I'm going to live. You won't need to support me anymore. And he went on to teach at the schools there. And that's how he took a stand in front of the... And he would go out with the people. They would get on the skidooey lawns in those days and go out in the bush. They would set traps. And he would live with the guys out there. And um, he, 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 he gave his life to the service of the Lord Jesus. And my dad tells a story of how there came a time when Chuck was a single guy. He was probably in his late 30s, probably early 40s. And he had met a gal who really meant a lot to him. She was a widowed lady. And um, she had a few kids. And in his, as he met this gal, um, he was kind of torn. He had three options. One was to marry her and come down here and stay with her and her family. Another option was to go up there or have her come up there and bring the kids, and he knew that was not going to work. And the third one was to part ways with her. And he knew if he came down here, he'd have to leave the ministry, right? He knew what would not work for him and her family knew there was going to be a big jump in the culture just for the family to come up there, and so that would not be really good either. And so because of his love for the Lord and his desire to minister, they parted ways. I think on a good note, but he gave her up for the Lord. In this passage of verse, verse uh, 7, says, Remember your leaders, those that love the Lord and were willing to give up for him. That's what it's telling us to do there. Moving on into verse 9, it says, and he goes back to, remember, this is written to the, the Jewish Christians. It says, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by ceremonial foods, which are of no value to those who eat them. And I want to bring, uh, just explain this a little bit. This maybe it sounds a little confusing. But to the Jewish Christians, what happened there? Before the time of Jesus, what were they doing? When they, um, they would go to the synagogue, Right? Kind of like our church. They would do that on their, their Saturdays. And they would, uh, what did you do if you were a sinner? Uh, you had sin. You'd bring a sacrifice, right? You'd bring a lamb or a goat. Maybe not every time, but there was these moments in your life. There were certain times when you were commanded. And then there were also times when you maybe had really had a bad moment. You needed to reconcile with God. You'd bring a lamb. Okay? And, so there, and there was also the ceremonial laws that you had, were supposed to keep. So here are these Jewish Christians. All along comes Jesus, and he says... I'm the lamb. I'm the one. I'm going to shed my blood for your sins. You won't need to bring those lambs to the temple anymore. How did that go over with the old timers? For some of those Orthodox Jews, that was really difficult. And it divided families. It divided communities. And the people that believed in Jesus were the oddballs. They were the ones that got kicked out of the house or out of the community, or whose businesses got boycotted. And so if you were going to follow Jesus, it's going to cost you. And this writer is telling us, don't get carried, apart, carried away by that. And, the, and the, the pressure was on the Jewish. They said, you know what, go ahead and follow God, and just go ahead and, and just do the, keep the old laws, and just still do the sacrifices. But they knew it was kind of like hiding Jesus when they did that. And so the, the challenge was identify with Jesus. Don't go back to those old ways. Don't go back to what we used to be. Stick with Jesus. And he says, um, I'm going to ask you a question as we get to verse 10 here. Um, we have in front of us a communion table. That's why part of the reason I'm sharing this this morning. Does everybody have the right to come and eat of this table this morning? It is a free country, right? But what does scripture say? Look at verse 10 there. It says, we have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. Okay, so if you had an Orthodox Jew, or maybe a one of the priests from in those days, or even from a Jew for, uh, from the, ta the tabernacle today, who does not believe in Jesus, do they have a right to eat at this table? The reality is, no, they do not. This, what we have in front of us, represents the blood and body of the Lord Jesus. Okay, and so this is for people who have, in their lives, come to the point where they say, you know what? I need the blood of Jesus to cover my sins. I need his body. I need him. When he was whipped, I need that to, take, to pay for my sins. And so for people who do not accept that and say, no, that's, I don't believe that stuff, when they, if they were to walk to the door this morning, where would we be glad they would come? But this is not for them. This is for people who understand what Jesus has done for them and have said, I want that for my life. 
Now, sometimes we put the bar so high, someone sins or does something, and we say, no, you shouldn't be taken either because you're living, you've got sin going on in your life. You know what? We do stumble and fall. I do a ministry at the jail. It amazes me. I don't go there a lot, but I've been there you know, fairly often on Wednesday. But um, as I go there, I see these guys, and it's interesting how many of them will read the scriptures, and some of them will start to lead, want the Lord. They, they believe, and they'll, I'll encourage them to turn to the Lord, get the Lord Jesus to cover their sins. And there are people having, my, my sister Judy especially has seen them work with the gals. Um, gals who, and they'll, they'll take a stand in front of their families who will laugh at them or say, you know, that's a white man's religion or whatever it is. Um, but they'll reject it. But these, these people, some of these people will turn to the Lord. And even though they turn to the Lord, you know what? They may end up back in jail. Is this table for them? Yes, it is. Because even though you may stumble in your life, this table, this blood and body, Jesus, they're looking to that to cover their sins. And we may have, we're, our, our salvation is, is built on what Jesus does for us, not how good we are. But that's who this is for, those who identify with the Lord Jesus. Moving on, then it says, I'll read that verse 10 again. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle, the priests and stuff, have no right to eat. And it says, the high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering. But the bodies are burnt outside the camp. I'll read just a little bit. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. You need to understand a little bit about the Jewish, what the, what the law said and how that worked in the Old Testament. Okay? When the tabernacle was up and going, and there was that priesthood system going, what they would do when a person sinned, or like on oh, the Day of Atonement, they would bring the, the lamb or the bull, and they would bring it to the altar. They would take his life by cutting his throat, and they would take some of the blood, and they would put it on the horns of the altar. Now, this is a sin offering. There's different types of offering, right? The ones that were for sin, that's what they would do. Do you know what they did with the rest of the body? Not the blood, but the rest of the body. They would take it from... From the altar, off the altar, take that body, the, the hide, the entrails, the, the meat of it. They would carry it outside the camp. Why? Because that's got the sin on it. Now it was supposed to be put outside. Your sin is supposed to, let's get the sin out of the camp. Let's get it away from the people of Israel. So they would take that body, take it outside the camp, and they would burn it out there. We watched, if you were here before Easter, we had a video one Sunday of a teaching like that, and it showed the valley where the, where the bodies were, and that, that kind of stuff was burnt. Okay, And so that's what they would do. Interesting enough, there's kind of a, a, a picture of what the Lord Jesus did there. It says, when he went to the cross, what happened? All the sins of the world were put on him. Where was he crucified, though? Outside the camp. He was partly because the sin is supposed to be taken outside the camp, right? God, had, as he sets up the crucifixion of Jesus, has it established that Jesus, the sin of Jesus, puts him, forces him outside the camp. Um, to kind of throw a little more light on it, make it more, more understandable, the two thieves, we know they're sinners, right? Why did they kill them outside the camp? Because they've got sin, Right? They're, 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 it's given. The society knows these guys are bad. They're sinful men. We're going to take them outside the camp. We're going to kill them out there. And that's what they did to them. Same way with Jesus. They got the sin of the world goes on. The Lord Jesus goes outside the camp. And he is killed out there. Okay, he's rejected by the Jew, Jewish society. We don't want you in the camp. You have the sin. You have sin on you. You're gone. You're outside the camp. The writer of Hebrews picks this up. He says, wait a minute, folks. We need to identify with Jesus who was rejected by the Jewish society and is put outside the camp. In my life, when I look back to seventh grade, I did not want to identify with Jesus. I wanted Jesus. I did not want to be ashamed of him, but I did not want to be ridiculed because of the Lord Jesus. What does the end of verse 13 say there? Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. The reality is if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, there's a certain amount of disgrace that you're going to have to carry. And the writer is encouraging people in a positive way. He says, you know what? Don't, don't be ashamed of it. Go identify with Jesus. Go outside the camp. 
Go outside the camp. We don't always want to do that. We want to, you know, with our friends and neighbors and the people that we just encounter in life, we want to be accepted by them, don't we? Isn't that kind of normal? What does the writer tell us? Identify with Jesus. Take the disgrace. Take the reproach that's there. And he said, and just to add a little bit more to verse 14 there, it says, For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for a city that is to come. You know what? Five years after I carried that Bible to, bag, this, to school, when I took it out of the brown bag, five years later, they had a ceremony and I graduated. And that city, that cement building there in Hinckley, that moved apart from my life. And I look back at those years that I went through school and I think of how under pressure we were to conform in those days. We know, I, when I was in like seventh grade, they got away from the polyester of the, seven, the 70s and they switched over to jeans and everybody wore blue jeans. A lot, it was either Adidas or white Nike, and later on it was like a white Nike t uh, tennis shoes and t-shirts. If you didn't dress that way, you were an oddball and you got labeled and you were become an outcast if you did not do it right. Okay? And so much of that, that has hampered me as a Christian because so many times... You know, I got programmed, it seemed like, in those days to dress and to be like everybody else. And so when it comes to the Lord Jesus, we do not want to many times stand up for the Lord because it will look weird. And I think it's been that way down through the centuries. But the encouragement comes to us. Go to Jesus outside the camp, outside the norm. Identify with him. Take the reproach. There's going to be a reproach. Stick with the Lord Jesus. Bear that reproach. When you take the communion this morning, we do that to remember the Lord Jesus and what he has done for us in the cross. But I'm asking you today, as you take it, to do it as a sort of an identification. You know, Lord Jesus, I'm going to go with you outside the camp. You died for me. I'm going to take the reproach. Give me the strength to do that. And so with that, we're going to go ahead and go forward with our, our communion time. Again, we want to remember the suffering, but also to identify, remember to identify with the Lord Jesus.